I'm Mason President Gregory Washington, welcoming you to another episode of Our Future Transformed, a series of conversations with Mason's leading experts about solutions to the grand challenges of today and tomorrow. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Guadalupe Carrera Cabrera of Mason's Shar School of Policy and Government to talk about the challenges and opportunities along the U.S.-Mexico border. In the news, the situation on the U.S.-Mexico border is often described as a crisis. In this context, there's been a lot of emphasis about crime along the border and criminals crossing the border. What's the problem? And why is the problem described this way? Well, that is a problem. We're just talking about the border in a negative sense. The border is a fascinating place. It is a place that's very diverse with wonderful people that involves a lot of dynamics um, that does not have to do only with border violence, drug trafficking, and undocumented migration. These uh, themes have been at the center of the discussion in the United States with regards to the Mexico-US border. When, when people describe, particularly the media and politicians in this country describe the border, they talk about these three themes. But the border is more than that. People live there. It's about trade, it's about culture, music, a different way of life because we're talking about two countries. And we're talking about two cultures together that sometimes mixed and form what it called a third country, un tercer país. We hear all this talk of cartels and a large number of undocumented people crossing the border and the like. How do we move beyond the stereotypes involving law enforcement and involving these kinds of things? Yes, uh, the Netflix series presents us, um, you know, these the image of, or what I call a myth, of the Mexican cartels, led by violent drug lords like El Chapo Guzman, or, I mean, we, we talk about many other uh, bad guys that, uh, that are, you know, presented in a certain way, featured in a certain way, uh, that commit crimes and kill people. And this is wrong, why? First of all, because this drives policy in a certain way. We cannot think about El Chapo Guzman. This is something much more complex. It's about the consumption of drugs, the demand for drugs, and the supply for drugs. This is a much more complex issue that does not only involve a Mexican organization led by a Mexican man and when Mexican or Latin American people are working there. This is much more complex, and we're probably not should not be talking about cartels. Cartels really do not exist as we conceive them in the Netflix series. We're really talking about a network of different actors working to get the drugs from, the, from, the, from point one where they are produced to where they are distributed and consumed. And we are talking about uh, organizations that sell precursors, that, perf I mean, that produce drugs, and also I mean, uh, companies that transport drugs, enforcers uh, that protect the cargo, and a number of actors like corrupt authorities and people who distribute the drugs in the neighborhoods. And, and so you're saying, you, you just described a pretty complex network. Right? And what you are saying is that that network doesn't necessarily have a head. Maybe it has many heads, maybe, uh, and, and, and these entities are coordinated, but not coordinated. Give us, give us a little more detail. This is important because exactly, we're really not talking about a cartel. First of all, a cartel is a group of very powerful businesses that are very well uh, structured that come together, sit down at a table, decide what to produce in order to get, or in order to get the, 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 the highest income that they can, controlling the price, controlling the markets. We're not talking about that. We're talking about as exactly a set of actors that form a network that sometimes uh, you know, get together. Sometimes they, we talk about corrupt authorities. They do their work. But in order to facilitate 
the, the cargo to pass through a zone, they ask for a bribe. So it's, I mean, this is very complex exactly. We talk about many people who lead these businesses. It's a set of businesses that form a, a, a set of systems too. Through systems theory or through network analysis, we will understand much better what it's so-called the drug trade. So we're talking about the drug trade. We're talking of not talking about cartels because cartels per se do not exist. We often talk about how all of this connects to jobs in the country. And in the US, we currently have a jobs crisis, right? We have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 0.8 million job openings at the end of January, according to the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Is there a connection between jobs and opportunity and what's happening at the border? Yes, it is. We see many people trying to make it to this country. The immigration system in this country is broken. The asylum system in this country is broken. And there have been attempts the attempts have been uh, performed or by the two parties, by partisan efforts to design comprehensive immigration reform to fix this broken system. Because people want to work here, jobs are available, but there are no legal migration pathways. Um, there are positions for unskilled labor, but sometimes it is better to have invisible uh, labor working for very, very low prices, and politics get into the way. And so yes, the availability of jobs make many people that are in circumstances of poverty, of violence, I mean, there are pull and push factors. The push factors work, but the pull factors are working really uh, strongly, and we don't talk about them. Jobs are available. Once you make it to the other side, you get a job for sure, and people are willing to travel to a dangerous journey to get here. But the focus, if you see, it's on the border. People who have the resources to pay a smuggler are going to get into the United States, are going to, uh, to get a job. So you highlighted earlier that the, the, what's happening at the border is very complex, right? And that uh, it involves multiple entities. It involves culture. And in, Obviously involves, obviously involves drugs and cartels. Uh, give us some positive aspects. Give us some things that are happening there in and around the border that actually could be seen as beneficial to both countries. Yeah, well, we are talking about two countries and we are talking about a region where the two countries meet themselves. Some people live on, on one side of the border. Many people live on the Mexican side of the border and they work on the other side. There's this exchange of cultures that, that make uh, the border a very special place. The music, the food, Tex-Mex food was, was born in the texas US mexico border. You know, this, this exchange, this, this, uh, this language also that is shared, Spanglish, um, and, and knowing another person from a different country, a different culture, enriches your own culture. And of course, you know, knowing the language, understanding the other, uh, the other is, is, is very important. Unfortunately, we're placing walls, barriers, technology, security that does not allow us to have this healthy conversation, but, but the culture exists. It's a third country. In Spanish, un tercer país. You know, this is, this is, this is, this is the way we, we, we talk at the border. I lived there eight years, and, and so, I loved it. So you have the border, obviously, with Texas, and uh, you, you know, have a very prominent border between Texas and Mexico. Yes. You also have prominent border between California and Mexico. Are they different? Or are yes, they different? absolutely. We cannot talk about the border as an homogeneous region. We can talk about multiple U.S.-Mexico borders because of the geography, the demographics. It's just so diverse, so interesting. People at the border are, are very friendly, uh, very 
very different. You know, they, they encounter, for example, they ha help undocumented migrants, asylum seekers on the Mexican side, on the US side of the border. People are used to this movement. So we, we, we were talking about a very special place, but the different regions at the border are, are I mean, we, ha we have different Mexico-US borders, and I have lived them, and I have understood to them, sometimes the food, sometimes the music, sometimes the problems. And there are some places that, that we're not just talking about people. We have landscapes that, I mean, they're semi-desertic or, or, yes. So your upcoming book describes your travels along the entire length of the border as you explored its communities, their food, their customs and culture, why is it important to bring those issues to light? Because the conversation has been centered on the negative things about the border. In the United States, in Mexico City, in some cities of Mexico too, but mainly in the United States, the public discussion, uh, politics have been centering in the negative parts of the border. And because I lived at the border, my co-author lived that, was born at the border, uh, at a border city. We have traveled three, as I said, three times all along the border. We, 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 we took thousands of photographs that are going to be, um, that are going to be included in this, in this book. We want, we want uh, our readers, the people who read the book, to, to know more, to know that this is not just a place uh, of negative things, and to understand really the dynamics. Because also the topic of migration has been misunderstood in this country, uh, has been connected with drugs, but migration has, been connect, has to be connected with, with the great things, with jobs, with possibilities, with opportunities, and the border starting to uh, lay out what the border is about, that it's more than drugs, violence, security, walls, division. It's about people. It's about connections. It's about a culture of two countries, a third country, that it's the mixture between two nations. There are some other aspects of the border that I, I find interesting. I really want to get your, your, your feedback. Uh, we're hearing now that uh, there is changes happening at the U.S.-Canadian border where individuals are, uh, and, and you can help us understand this, they start in Mexico, but then they bypass the U.S., they go to Canada, and then from Canada they enter the U.S. that way, right? Or they stay in Canada. Uh, and so we're getting another border uh, kind of relationship uh, happening at the U.S.-Canadian border. Right. Uh, can you talk any uh, about that? Have you seen that in your, uh, uh, your travels? Yes, well, we have been focusing on the U.S.-Mexico border, but also I have an edited volume, I co-edited a volume on the two borders of North America. Uh, the Canada-U.S. border and the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's different. As, as it is different on the Mexican side versus the U.S. side, the Canada-U.S. border is different. But it has become much more complex, too, because of this lack of uh, legal migration pathways. So asylum seekers and economic migrants are trying to find different ways. But now, what happened just last week was this extension of the uh, safe third country agreement between Canada and the United States. They had it all, but they are now they are applying to all the Mexico-US border, and they are not going to um, admit uh, asylum seekers if they have not already been regular in the United States. So uh, this is a way that has been now utilized to prevent um, the, the, uh, I mean, the arrival of economic migrants that are occupying a space uh, of refugees um, because they are applying for asylum on the other country. So now we're talking about North America. It's an issue that matters, no, I mean, that, that would take the collaboration of the three countries of North America, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And these measures, like the extension of the Safe Third Country Agreement, is just one step 
forward to, f to fix this issue because advocates um, have criticized this extension of the third safe country agreement. They would like to have open borders, but we have, um, uh, I mean, we have a social contract of immigration that needs to be protecting the people that are in need of protection, refugees, asylees. Um, and, and this has been because, because the immigration system and the asylum system is broken, we need to heal it. And this is a part to, to deal with that, to, um, I mean, to deal with the integrity of the whole system. Well, as I turn to you all here today, we have a number of our students in the audience. I'd like to open it up uh, for questions. So any questions you have uh, would be greatly appreciated. So you touched briefly on like how you're talking about like the Netflixication of like cartels and stuff. But what do you think are other ways that media has like changed the common Americans view of our U.S. Mexico border? Yes. Uh, well, the Netflix series present this as a problem only of Mexico, Mexicans who are the ones who perpetrate violence or the, with the possibility of perpetrating violence. People that are brown, that look like Mexicans, that are Mexi of Mexican origin. Everything negative has to do with a Mexican person, a narco, the serious narcos, who are the good and who are the bad people. The bad people are Mexicans and the good people are white and they are Americans, they are the DEA agents. Right? If you have, if you have watched Narcos, they are the people of the law and order. But that's not the way we should see this because this is a very complex issue. How drugs enter to the United States, how they are received and distributed around. This is a problem that is not portrayed in, in, in the Netflix series. It is just about the bad people coming from the South, and it generates a negative perception. We need to change that. We need to understand that the fentanyl crisis in the country is not, is not about the border, and it's not about Mexico. It's about a series of factors that explain uh, how white people in this country are dying um, of overdose. Thank you. Okay, so um, that was a lovely conversation to listen to, by the way. Um, and I'm not an economist in the slightest, but I do have a vague idea of how supply and demand affect each other. And um, I'm a very solutions thinking person. So I was wondering, do you think it's better to tackle the supply of the drug problem at the border or tackle the demand, which I'm thinking more towards demand because I I think the best way to tackle this problem is by starting with young children and improving education on it, because I know I had my dare pledge not to do drugs in middle school, but other than that, that was it. Um, so yeah, it just seems very easy for young people to fall into this. Wonderful question, absolutely. Uh, since the declaration of the war on drugs by former President Richard Nixon, the focus of, uh, of um, the strategy, drug strategy, drug policy in the United States has been the supply, and it has been a total failure. The focus of the DEA, the kingpin strategy, going after the narcos, going after the Mexicans, going after the Colombians. What do we have now after almost 50 years of a war in drugs? Almost $1 trillion that we have been spent on fighting uh, the cartels mainly. Nothing, we, have, we had the second phase of the opioid epidemic, the fentanyl crisis. So there's nothing more failed uh, that, than, than, the, than the dr that drug policy in the United States. Of course, of course, we have to focus on prevention. We have to focus on the demand because demand creates its own supply. That's what is happening. You kill or you arrest one drug lord and then another drug lord is coming because the business is so lucrative. And if we don't deal with this uh, issue as an issue of public health, with education, and uh, I mean, with the communities, the, the, the society is very sick in many ways. Uh, the origins of, of this crisis also has to do with the pharmaceutical companies, has to do also with crisis of the real estate sector. People lose their home, people lose their illusions. Uh, people have expectations and expectations are never fulfilled because we live in a very unequal nation. We have to deal with the root causes of the consumption of drugs in the United States.
Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for like taking time out of your day to speak to us. Um, I had one question rep like about representation. Um, you briefly talked about it in the first question that you answered. Um, how do you think your book will illuminate the real culture at the border or change the representation currently like, advertised, like, such as the Netflix series Narcos? How do you think your book would really illuminate on the real representation and culture of the border? That's a great question. And this is one of the objectives that we have. We're going to be talking about each border municipality, 37 Mexican, uh, sorry, 37 Mexican municipalities and 23 uh, U.S. Uh, border counties. And we're going to be talking about them, about the people, about what really this is about. We are talking about the U.S. side and the Mexican side. And this is the way that you... Uh, deal with representation. We talk about the people, we talk about the, uh, the music, the culture, trade, uh, migration, a number of economic activities, um, politics, uh, society, I mean society. Yeah, and this is the way that we really address these issues. It's not only about drugs or it's not about uh, Mexican drug lords. This is about much more and explaining each municipality on each side of the border, the dynamics and, and the, also the events and the, even the famous people or the people who have done sports have been, be, have been famous of sports from there. You kind of have a better sense of this third country that uh, has representations on both sides. We have Mexicans, we have Americans, we have Mexican-American people that were born in one side but live on the other side. That, that also come from different countries. The, the border has become a place where many people from different countries are applying for asylum and now they have to live on the Mexican side, mainly people from Central America, from Cuba, from Venezuela, from Colombia, and now they are part of the border communities of Mexico particularly. So I'm involved with the Carter School, so I'm a conflict analysis and resolution major, and I was wondering, um, one of the things that we learn in our classes is that identity is central to your environment as well as societal factors. And so when you're talking about that new emerging like third country idea between um, Mexican American citizens or people who are really intertwined with the border, I was wondering how has the identity of immigrants been shifting based on the way that like, both the border as well as Mexico and the United States have also kind of been shifting? That's also a great question because borderlanders um, identify as borderlanders. I mean, with all these other uh, identities that, that are right now uh, very open and, and all that. But uh, I am not talking about this third country as it is something new. This third country has been there forever. It's just a mixture of, of, of uh, cultures, of identities. And as I said, borderlanders uh, have their own language, which is Spanglish sometimes, right? Uh, some people don't speak Spanish. Some people don't eat, uh, speak English on both sides, of course. But, uh, but now, uh, as I also mentioned, we have more people coming from different parts of the world. The migrant smuggling networks have become, and, the, and, and the, the, the world is becoming much more complex. The war in Ukraine, you know, further conflicts, Syria, the conflict in the Middle East, bring more people from Afghanistan, from the Middle East, from, South, uh, from, from Eastern Europe, from the African, different countries of the African continent, from everywhere. So yes, in that sense, the third country is not just about the United States and Mexico. Now it has become a much a, a multicultural uh, region, and now in this sense, this third country is right now changing. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Professor Carrera Cabrera, for your time today and engaging us. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of this week's episode of Our Future Transformed.